Hi, I'm Beverly Copeland. This is Saturday, uh, May the 11th, 2013. This is part three. I want you to know that I now my YouTube is up and running. You can see the Beverly, you can see a lot of things on YouTube. I'm going to get my series on jazz there. It is the best. I had such, I had a, you know, a, a, a jazz professor and a, a jazz musician two jazz musicians, a jazz vocalist, a blues jazz singer, and a, a and, and they're a couple. Uh, and it, I, it's the best that I've ever seen on jazz. They were phenomenal, the McIntyre. So I'm gonna put that up, I gotta find it. And I have so much stuff. So now that YouTube is up and running, I'm gonna get that stuff up on YouTube. But anyway, today, what I'm talking, I'm gonna talk about the fact that there is and has been an ongoing process to destroy the old world order and to replace it with a Polish-led, Euroslav, hegemonic new world order. And I must say that it has been done through a stealth below the radar campaign, uh, but it is real and, and we see it every evidence of it everywhere where the world has turned has been turned into pure hell for so many people. Uh, we I told you that I was told that the architect of it is a man named Zbigniew Brzezinski and his books like the Grand Chessboard, like Between Two Ages, and his more re recent writings post his books read like the blueprint for the destruction of the old Anglo-Saxon corporate capitalist hegemony for this new Polish Euroslav world order, which will would be a disaster, a disaster. It will be radical and revolutionary beyond belief and a disaster. And how he has gotten so far, or how that it has, in my opinion, been been a collaborative effort among the American political intellectual class. They have used fear to hoodwink the ruling class, the capitalists, the blue bloods, and the church, most notably the most important church, the Catholic Church, to either give tacit approval or to, to approve of this. Fear, the black threat, the yellow peril even though they know there is no real black threat, there is no yellow peril because of weapons technology. When I was a student at Columbia University, I was taught, oh, back in the 1970s, there's no, the weapons had become so advanced that they had weapons technology then that destroyed life but did not destroy property. So professors would joke, oh, so if this, this was during the Cold War, if the Soviets get out of hand, we'll drop a neutron bomb, you know, on Soviet Union. That will destroy all life. That will solve the West, the West job problem. They'll destroy the life, and then we'll send Western people who need jobs to run the property. And, and they used to show me jokes. There is no, in terms of population threat, because of weapons technology, like the neutron bomb. That was in the 1970s. So you know today it has been so refined that there is no threat in terms of population. The threat of these stealth IT campaigns that technology has um, advanced for the first time in human history. These stealth IT campaigns that we see evidence of that have uh, by the, the ruling class, the capitalists being used, be, the, the political, in my opinion, I'm entitled to my opinion, by using fear to hoodwink the capitalists into believing there was a threat, they have hoodwinked the, the, the powers that be into thinking they had to destroy themselves to save themselves. So we see these, uh, this, this life being turned into pure hell. But I think they're coming out of the coma, the capitalists, because they're asking all these questions, you know, because it's not helping capitalism to destroy markets. It's not helping the capitalism. It's as if they learned from what happened with the Arab Spring, destroying that lucrative market, the oil-producing states, I mean, you know, the Arab states, 
So they're not going to they're not going to let them expand the neocon war into Asia. To just that would really be devastating because who could American workers produce for if they have that then that Asian market is destroyed if life is turned to pure hell in Asia. God bless Kim Jong Un for. He doesn't have nuclear weapons, but holding and not dismantling because that fear, not that he actually has them, but the fear that he might get them, has been a deterrent from expanding, in my opinion, the new neocon paradigm war paradigm to Asia. And Jesus, if they, those the Asians aren't buying things, hey, nobody's going to be selling anything. There'll be no jobs anywhere in America, Asia, anywhere else. That's the largest and most lucrative market at this point. So uh, they've used, they're coming out of the coma. They said it doesn't make sense for us to destroy ourselves, destroy our markets, our industry. You know, what it does is, you know, it's, it used to be if, if, one, um, if one group were, one power interest were, they would go to a, con a war. It used to be conventional war, right? Now it's not a conventional war, but the impact is the same. It's de devastated our allies in the middle in the in the in the, in, in the Middle East. It's devastated this. These policies have devastated America. It's almost as if, for example, it's almost as if the country's been through a war, right? The economic malaise. The re I mean, it's like it's devastated, devastated. All of these are confluent these policies because they've drained so many resources from. Uh, being reinvested in this country to be outsourced for neocon wars and all kind of folly like that, that it said that the impact is equivalent to have having a war in the country being devastated, ravaged by war, by war, an expansion of poverty, infrastructure decay, all of that. So uh, it has really been a betrayal of the covenant, really, by these uh, political intellectual class, in my opinion. And I must say, I am disheartened that other scholars who were aware of what Brzezinski was doing hadn't, had, not, had not blown the whistle on what was going on. So many of the <coughs> scholars at these elite schools, all they do is the capital, it's the capitalist, and they know damn well that the capitalists are being spurned as much as everybody else. They, they know, these elites, these scholars at these elite schools have known what was going on, and they've been, if, if not given, if not actively involved in this process, they've given tacit approval because they didn't blow the whistle on it. It's taken, it's taken people, little people like me to do that. They had to know. Many of them had to know. At places that I went to school, like Columbia, they had to know. Of course they knew. They're so busy blaming the capitalists, and they've been there. Oh, please, don't get me, don't get me started. But I wanted to say that there has been a planned and systematic process to destroy this money, this country. We see that with the military-industrial complex, the shift of resources to the neocon paradigm. We see that in education, right? All the money now in, in special ed, in special ed. It has been a disaster. It has incentivized destroying children through the educational system. Because once a, because now you see how, how it works is this, part of that planned and systematic process. Because all the money in education, public ed, so much of it is in special, things like special ed, special ed charter schools. So, so special ed means that the teachers make more money, the teachers get more resources, they get more support aids, right? So it teaches assistance. So, you know, it incentivizes educators to destroy children because if they want to get more money, if they want to get more resources, they want to get help in the classroom, they have to be in special ed. So. That is why I think so many children have been shunted, pushed into special ed, who clearly and unequivocally never needed special ed. Never needed it. And if, I would argue, if the incentives had been the other way for gifted programs, right, if teachers in gifted programs for gifted children made more money, 
had more resources and more support, like assist teacher's assistant, then it would be all of these Einsteins, every kid in America, all these black and poor and black and Latino and poor white kids, they would be, instead of needing special ed, always the bubble, it would be always such an Einstein. And the truth be told, they are little Einsteins, yes. So it incentivizes dysfunction in education. That has been the policy of public education in this country to incentivize the destruction of the American child. And when the annals, when the history of this episode in public education is written, it is clear that that is the story that's going to be told. Public education incentivized the destruction of the American child by incentivizing the educators and the education bureaucracy to support special ed. Now, I was shocked when I first saw this, and I've discussed this on my show through the years, when I went into a school in Brooklyn, New York, and I, I hadn't been in a public school in years, and I said to the principal system, what happened? Where's the money? Where's the... Where's the sports? Where's the arts? Where's the music? Where's the gifted programs? And she said, all the money's going to special ed. It was like a hollowed out shell and chaos. So special ed, that has been, and you know, and so, so you say, so why, why not? Why didn't they do it in gift? Why didn't they, why wasn't the money, in my opinion, why it was done? It's part of the process to destroy this country by the Polish, what I call the Polish lobby. Also, I'm not being cynical, but there are only so many slots at Harvard and Yale. And if these black kids were in these gifted programs, it would be a few. Let me tell you. Let me tell you, these poor whites, these black kids, these Latino kids who see the in who have the, the enriched view of society, the inside outside of you. Cole and Schwartz and those other people couldn't get into Harvard or Yale. I'm just being, you know. So, uh, so the black kids, it's terrible what has done. I talked to my father about it. I said, uh, Daddy, how come when you went through, and my mother too, she went to school in Georgia, but my father went to school in New York, part, part of his education, and his cousins in New York. And without affirmative action, they got into Ivy League schools. They got into, I'm not the first one to go to a, a specialized school like Bronx Science. They did all that. And my parents, both my father and mother, were as literate today as someone with a, a, a college uh, a degree, right? Right? And I know that because my mom, I was an edge. I taught at college, and my mother had a part-time job. And I showed the re evaluation and it was all outstanding because she was so she so literate. My father too. So in fact, people, you know, so um, I asked my father, Daddy, how come when your family came up from Virginia, and they went to the public schools, they were able to do so well? He and and the black kids did the back. He said because when he went to the public school, the principal was Murphy or O'Malley, and you know, if the teacher didn't teach, she, he didn't want to hear, it was the kids had hard, bad family situations, he fired them. Today, the teacher, that he, my father said, is those you, today, you can't get rid of a teacher who doesn't teach. And then, you know, they make it a joke. In New York, it's called, they have a room for teachers who've been brought up on disciplinary charges, like sexual predators, and they put them in what is called a rubber room. And they collect a check, and sometimes they're there for several years, and they have nothing to do. They read the newspaper, what, take two-hour lunch, whatever. And they call it the rubber room. It's not a joke. Now, you know, it, it's not a joke. So there's been a destruction of education. Because my father, too, he said, there's no excuse for the kids not learning today. And the antidote to it is one word, and you know proof too, right? These Asian kids, some of them come from horrific, horrific situations, right? They say the parent, it's not parental involvement necessarily. For example, let me give a, 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 a possible scenario. During just the Vietnam War, right? A kid whose mother in Vietnam 
sold her body and was a heroin addict to get well, to the GIs to get money, who saw his father hatchet to death by the Viet Cong, whose family left Vietnam on a rickety boat, which was raided by Thai pirates, so he saw his mother, his sisters, his grandmother's aunts gang raped by Thai pirates. They end up in an Indo-Chinese, really, detainment camp, concentration camp. Eventually, the family ends up in Chinatown in the studio apartment, 15 people in a studio apartment. The expectation of the New York City public school system, he didn't speak English, was that he was going to go through the New York City public school system. His parent, mother didn't speak English. His father, he saw a machete to death. His mother was going to come and get one of these menial jobs. They were going to work like the slaves, didn't speak English. He was going to go through, graduate on time, get a scholarship to college, and enter the mainstream. Yet the expectation of a black kid in the projects or in the shelter, that he's going to go to special ed, and he's going to graduate he can't illiterate, functionally illiterate, and become a criminal. The soft bigotry of low expectations. There's no excuse. Why the Asian, they have one set of expectations, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. And for the black kid, it's a different set of expectations, and it becomes a self. Too often, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Not for all. Many, some, a lot of kids do go through, and they go on to college, etc., etc. Relative to that Asian, the black kid living in the shelter or the projects is so much better off and better psychologically equipped to make it through. And he has all sorts of advantages, like the language advantage, right? But it is the soft bigotry of low expectations, and it is a planned and systematic process, in my opinion, as a former educator, to destroy American children. Not only black, but white too. Not to mention, but what do you say? Well, what is the antidote? Listen, that's another thing. Everyone in education, well, not everyone. I have on this show, I talked to the deputy mayor for education, Bloomberg's Dennis Walcott, shortly after Bloomberg came in. I said the solution is vouchers, vouchers, vouchers. It's, this, it's so simple. It's like Einstein equals MC square, vouchers. Vouchers would straighten up the public education mess in this country like that. You said, but why? Because if parents and people, parents are more than capable of deciding the best choice for their child. If parents got vouchers, right, and took their kids out of failing public schools and put their kids in parochial schools or private schools, <clears throat> and the education bureaucracy, all that money left the system, there, and teachers and bureaucrats, education bureaucrats lost their jobs, there would be a tremendous incentive to straighten out the mess, and they would. It's not being cynical, it's keeping it real. Overnight, from Johnny Jones needs special ed, and he can't do it. Oh, he's an Einstein, Johnny Jones is an Einstein, he's a genius. And he can excel. And you know what? It would work. So the critically important question becomes, why no vouchers? I mean, it, it's not a, it doesn't take a genius to understand that that would solve the public education and problem in this country like that. So all these people, you see these mayors like Bloomberg and all these people talking about, oh, I, I mean, to me, it's not real because where's the voucher program? Where's the voucher program? They say, oh, it's the teachers union. Bull. Bull. If they can ramrod all these other things, they can ramrod a voucher program. And it would be a blessing because it would, the public education mess would be straightened out overnight. And we need a good competitive workforce. And if we keep shunting kids into things like special ed, we are destroying America's most valuable resource, our children. I don't have children. America's children. I don't have person. I don't have children. We are destroying America's most valuable resource, her children. You know, you know, by, by uh, really, especially that it not only destroys, but criminalizes them too.
because they grad they finish the educational system illiterate and there's no opportunity for many of them for, for, there's no opportunity but if there were vouchers they get it together overnight because you can have a, across the street from each other in, in the poorest congressional district in this country, the South Bronx, you can have a private school, I mean, a, you can have a public school and a parochial school, right? The kids, the same demographic, right? Yet the parochial school, the kids are reading and performing and doing the academic subjects at or, a grade, at or above grade level. You walk through the halls in the parochial school, you can hear a pin drop. But then the, uh, the public school, it's like a zoo. They say, I hope of people who go to parochial, blah, blah, blah. But they found when they've done, they've had um, um, lotteries where it's just random who gets to get, go to the, the voucher to go to the parochial school or private school. The kids in the public school who's the shelter, the total chaos, and they're most at risk, when they get the voucher, they, 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 they perform like the other kids in the parochial school. Those nuns, because they, those kids know, those nuns and those priests know that those kids can do it, and they have God on their side, and they, and so those kids know those nuns and priests, priests know that they can do it, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. They perform at or above grade level. It is racism is very, very intimidating. So the kids at the public school, the authority is the teacher, and the teacher is saying, you can't do it. So it becomes a different, different set of expectations. The kids fail. The soft bigotry of low expectations. I'm not saying overwhelm the kids, no. But it, it vouchers is the, the solution to that problem. And then there's the whole social welfare problem in this country, right? Social services, right? It incentivizes dysfunction. It ins you can't get housing. If you're working poor, you can't. I mean, for example, I was involved in the, in the, uh, the, the bleed person in the WEP program, the welfare to work when they had the welfare to work legislation. It was a, I must pat myself, it was a great program. We got people on welfare, we trained them, we got them ready for work. It was wonderful. You know, the kids were so proud of their mothers going and their fathers working for the city and everything, you know, through the training. People want to work. The, these women, they, they, this, there is pride. I'm working for the city. I'm a clerical, a secretary working for the city. And oh, they were, had pride and the kids had pride. The problem was the city... Juliana, you got to give him credit on this too. The problem was we were, our hands were tied, right? Once they graduated from the program, their benefits were cut. Instead of subsidizing the work, so then they fall through the cracks again, they go through the shelter system and all of that. Instead of incentivizing people to work, the whole system is rigged to incentivize dysfunction. If you are, you know, it incentivizes addiction. If you're an addict, you get housing and all of that stuff. If you are, uh, you know, you know, you get it. But if you're working poor and you're trying to work, there's no incentive for you to work. Because once you start working, you're going to get your, all your government subsidies are taken away from you. Right? So the whole, and you know, this has been going on for a long, long time. And so you have to say it's a planned process. It's got to be a planned and systematic process because it's been going on for since I was a little kid. People used to complain about people on welfare, but, you know, used to be in the day the benefits were more generous. So why work if, why work if being on welfare meant that you were going to get subsidies? So there are no jobs now. So people be, get turned to dope now. Many people, it just, it just encourages addiction in order to get help from the government. So it's just like from Hitler to George Bernard Shaw, don't make America world leader. So the whole social service process incentivizes addiction, dysfunction, illegitimacy, dysfunction,
it doesn't encourage people to be productive members of society because once you're a productive member of society you don't get help from the government and this is how it's been uh, for a long and we mock the European system we call them socialists but that's why those societies are so much more healthier and so much more vibrant many of them the Western European countries but now, the, and by the way, we talk about, you see now all the chaos in Western Europe? It is far healthier than the situation in New York. You see the economic dislocations, unemployed. It's terrible what's going on, but at least they, it's not the government. What this government is doing is monetizing the debt, printing money like pre-Nazi Germany. And when the bottom falls out, it's going to be far worse here than in Europe, where those governments have not been doing that. So we see the economic dislocations, unemployment, et cetera, et cetera. We are sort of like at what, it, what the situation that occurred before the last Great Depression, 1930s crash. There was a burst of new technologies, the roaring 20s, electronics, all those gadgets, electricity, Edison, light bulbs, refrigerated stoves, cars, all of those gadgets and gizmos. So there, was a, there were all these companies, right? Then there was a crash, then there was a shakeout, and then there was a consolidation of the wealth. And so now we had all these IT technologies and we have all this stuff, and we face the same thing, a crash, and then there will be a consolidation of, of the wealth. There is a struggle now between the Polish lobby and the old world order as to who is going to control this wealth after the shakeout. I'm Beverly Copeland. This has been the Beverly Copeland Report. Let us pray that it is the Anglo-Saxons uh, who, uh, capitalists, who maintain control. And it is tragic that they were hoodwinked into believing that they had to destroy themselves in order to save themselves at, by the Polish lobby. I'm Beverly Copeland. This has been the Beverly Copeland Report.